Ender's game does a good job of teaching us about the aliens with just visuals. And giving their ships an organic ribcage skeletal looking structure immediately leads you to assume they're less advanced than the humans, and therefore mindless killing machines. The international fleet decided that the world's smartest children are the planet's best hope. Raised on war games, their decisions are intuitive, decisive, fearless. A weird prediction about the future from the 80s that... Yeah, whether there's evidence to support it now, it's a believable impetus for the story. It's at the very least exactly what I thought I was doing sitting in front of my Nintendo as a kid. Am I, am I not a military leader? You sure? These posters immediately made me think I had maybe missed some Starship Troopers level satire. But nah, it's just propaganda. This won't hurt a bit. And that was the last lie Ender was ever told by an adult. Oh, I mean, first, in this movie at least. But adults lying to kids is a motif to say the least. To be fair, I actually get its purpose in the story. The nurses on the island were just blaming. <laughs> Resourcefulness, which pretty much defines Ender's character. In fact, this scene is a great intro to Ender and what a skilled tactician he is. One on one. Then why are your boys holding me? He reduces his enemy's numbers and then tries one last time to defuse the situation before escalating the violence. This will not be the last time the movie plays with the idea of a superior opponent being defeated by Ender. You could almost call it outmatched shadowing. And so I will. Also brutal. Loving all the little details, like the posters and action figures in the boys' room, and then also subtle reminders we're in the future with, I guess, a light switch or something? I should have been chosen. Say what you will about the higher-ups in this film, at least they knew enough to cut this psycho from the program. Didn't stop him from becoming a hegemon. There was less competition, and still I didn't make it. You have nothing to be ashamed of. Quick little cliche dodge. The first couple of expressions from him lead us to believe he's a stereotypical, overbearing, disappointed father. But then it turns out he's actually compassionate, reasonable, and empathetic towards his son. Knocking him down was the first fight. I wanted to win all the next ones, too. Man, they spell this story right out in the first ten minutes. Of course this is who Graf is looking for. I don't usually do this, but I'm, I'm going to reiterate that if you have any interest in science fiction and or if ethical quandaries intrigue you and you haven't seen this movie, I'm probably going to spoil it pretty soon, and it'll no doubt be with a dumb joke. So go watch it, and then come back. Ender and I should have a private conversation. Absolutely not. With all respect, sir, you really can't stop me. One of the benefits of a military state 1984 society. Wait, who wrote that? If there's a chance that because of you, the Formics might leave us alone forever. You know, because they'll all be dead. See, that was that was like no time at all. Hope you listened. I'm Ender. Ender? What kind of name is that? Species Ender. My friends call me Ender for short. Gotta love the upside down wide shot to establish their weightlessness. You know what he's talking about? Yes, sir. No, you don't. Uh, I'm really enjoying old man Ford with his curmudgeon attitude. He'll be perfect for the Gran Torino remake in five years. There's only one kid on this launch with any brains at all so far, and that's Ender Wigan. Rough to be set apart, but I love the way everything is set up in this film. Everything has a payoff. His isolation, winning all future fights, the enemy's gate is down. Ugh. But how about this score? Michael Bay's best buddy Steve Jablonski does it again. Some optimistic strings building to just enough grandeur to showcase the battle school station. And another exterior to interior spinning shot that solidifies the weird gravity, illustrating to us what the kids are probably feeling and that the artificial gravity isn't quite right. We need a Julius Caesar, a Napoleon. Caesar was assassinated by the people he trusted. And Napoleon lost in the end. Not before he conquered the known world. I mean, come on. Graf's whole worldview is in every word out of his mouth. Ender's end doesn't matter to him, nor does how he gets there. One thing matters to Graf. Love it. So, the battle room is pretty much the coolest thing ever. Weightlessness and a giant glass ball with a view of Earth? What? No, I'm, I'm sure it's transparent aluminum. Well, I think everything is Star Trek. At least it should be. Maybe the enemy's gate is down. I like it. Like they're a bug to be crushed under our feet. Exactly. We're occasionally reminded that they're children. It's honestly something that gets a little lost in the pages, because Ender's writing and inner monologue is generally not that of a kid. Even more so when Valentine and Peter start taking over the government by blogging. You're flapping around like a bunch of drunken ducks. So did Graf like stumble onto a bunch of drunk ducks, or did he give ducks booze and then try to make them fly? Hashtag real questions. If either side gets one cadet through their enemy's gate unharmed, that army will win, regardless of points already scored. Again, reiterating that everything about Ender and everything he goes through sends him down the path that he ends up choosing in the end. Even the rules of this game that irritate most people in games like these. Having a nothing else in the game matters if X. Like accidentally sinking the eight ball in pool or the snitch in Quidditch. Which I'll admit is kinda lame. But these are war games, and if you wipe a species out, not much else that's happened leading up to that matters. You win. 
And Battle School is fun montage is the fastest way to make new friends. You have the right to privately think whatever you wish, Wigan. Generosity. You will never be a commander. I will never salute you. Yes, you will, Sergeant. <laughs> Self-confidence. Using the gravitational pull from this planet. This is basic rocket science, people. Basic rocket science. Man, I think Bean or I have a better handle on this than I do. Delegation. So is that like an Afkapu keyboard? Because I just learned about that just now. I'm over here still trying to master Dvorak. In three short steps, Ender becomes their leader. He stands up for their rights to General Graf, and then even more so asserts his self-assurance to Dap, then shows some modesty in conceding that another student may be better at a particular task, and finally stands up for the little guy. Pretty much all genius. Gavin Hood, the director, did the mocap for the giant, and I gotta be honest, I don't like your face. But even in a minigame inside the movie, the animated giant has a cinema wind's favorite, the reflection of the green glass in his grayish iris. And here's another plain and laid out theme of the film and foreshadow of Ender's final solution. It's hard to believe this wasn't specifically planned to create that way of thinking. It's breezed over, but the giant literally says, Inside, or I'll bite your head off. It's the exact situation the humans believe they're in. Kill or be killed. So yeah, it's dark. But literally, what is he supposed to do? Telepathize? Oh, uh, well, maybe. I've never seen anyone do that. Perfect. He's perfect. Compliments. Assalamu alaikum. Peace to you. And a lie is the Valentine stand-in here, reminding Ender of his humanity, even in the face of success through violence. Come on. Ball. Strike two. Give me the ball. Notice the difference in the way Bonzo breaks the rules in a wholly self-serving way, whereas Ender always breaks the rules strategically. Great reflexes. You guys didn't mention you already had a Napoleon. Okay, you can't just keep your thumb on the trigger. You need half a second to recharge. It's the difference between a tenth and a half second, but in battle, that's a long time. Even Petra being a master of the recharging process and timing is set up for the future. I already gave you an order. I know, in front of everybody. And you don't want your soldiers to think that you back down. So, for tonight, you can say that you won this argument. I love watching Ender play Bonzo. Just enough of a challenge to garner Bonzo's respect, and then he steps back and submits to let Bonzo feel in control. Everything about the way Ender treats him is so superior, like a human convincing a dog to lie down. Maybe by watching my tunes you'll learn something, and I can trade you easier. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Dance, puppy, dance! All right, pretty cool flip move gun grab. You get a yup, Ender. Not Disney! Is this why this movie never got a sequel? I love that Graf is mad here, because even if he can't understand what's going on, he has to have a feeling. It's clear to us, having watched the film, that this is the queen trying to reach out to Ender's mind, and that's mixing into the game. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see she's equating herself with his sister, i.e. innocent. Well, we at least know it's a possibility that they could be fighting a real enemy within a month. I like that they don't actually hold the twist that close to the chest. And why not a new name, sir? Because we already have the uniforms. Practicality and frugality. There's some defense fiscal responsibility. Do you think they'll follow me? Whew, that'll get you right in the confused relationship with authority, doubting yourself and being given respect by a former superior who claimed he'd never give you said respect and now has you actually respecting him for said respect feels. You know, something like that. I intend to make it the best in this school. I think you can help make that happen. Subtle little show of reverence from Bernard. At first, when Ender gave the at ease command, Bernard crossed his arms. Once Ender tells him he has some faith in him and shows him some respect, he puts his arms in the correct position. That's some freaking teamwork. And it's actually protect the little Dr. MD gun teamwork shadowing. If I'm being honest, at this point, Ender is a bit of an unstoppable Gary Stu. But that's kind of the point. He is the perfect killing machine, the perfect strategist. Every time he's presented with insurmountable odds, he overcomes. Bonzo thought he could disrupt that streak, but he only played further into it by challenging Ender naked in the shower. So, Ender lathers soap on his arms and shoulders where he knows Bonzo will grab him and slip off and then sprays him in the face with hot water. At this point in Ender's story, he's not ready to end Bonzo and break his arm, but he just hasn't been pushed hard enough yet. I also love how quick and real this fight is. Nothing overly choreographed. He's gonna die, isn't he? Mm, depends if you're watching or reading. But that's not someone who's ever gonna be the same. So, appropriate reaction. Send me home, Colonel, or I will resign. Don't threaten me, boy. I'm not the enemy. Ugh, what a moment between these two. Asa rides the line between wounded and self-assured like a champ, and Harrison continues to prove why he's no one to mess with. We're using these children to win the war. And if they come home, it's my job to put them back together again. And the cliche response, so I'll give you a cliche dodge here because it probably goes without saying, but I think it needs to be said, at least they'll have a home to go home to. And when I truly understand them, you also love them. Except Bonzo, because screw that guy.
did I mention Jablonski's score? Hot dang, send me to an alien planet, I'm ready to fight. Do you have a name? Miza Reckham. Oh, snap. Love a good Trev, I mean Ben Kingsley twist. Lost him in the war. Tomokul. I'm not totally sold on Mazer's Kiwi accent, but I'll give them some credit for honoring Maori history. So I have made speak for the dead. So I had this whole stupid thing planned with a title card explosion for a Speaker for the Dead trailer, and my video editor just couldn't render it. So I put the broken, crappy version up on Patreon. I know you patrons love a good, dumb joke. The point was, we'll never see that movie, but they referenced the book. Salam alai. Salam, Commander. Bernard. Good to see you, sir. At ease. You know how I feel about satisfying moments. I feel good. This is a satisfying moment. Ooh, I love a good super speed zoom. If I ever make a movie, you can bet it's gonna have one of those. For something innocuous, like mailing a letter. Your tune leaders will each command a battle group. I mean, of course everything they've been doing to prepare had a real world correlation. But number one, cool that they still call them tunes. Number two, tricky that they still call them tunes. It's all about convincing them it's just a game. We will have no alternative but to engage. I trust we have chosen our commander well. There's greatness in him, sir. And a killer instinct too, I hope. So in the book, it's all spelled out clearly in the end, but in the movie, I like that you get to piece it all together. This conversation and Rackham's assertion of photo real wink wink nudge nudge means something different on second viewing. Their very existence is a threat. Is that clear, Commander? Clear, sir. A lot of the hype for this movie was built around these virtual battles, and while they don't show up until the last act, they really don't disappoint. And if you follow along, it's not just pew pew pew. Ender actually uses strategy, having the drones distract the alien ships while a lie and beans dreadnought sneak in below to obliterate them. Fox drop 3889. Ender, watch our right flank. We need backup for Bernard. I see it. Bernard, you flag them. Copy that. Using 10 through 8. Pretty serious teamwork going on here. You can't absorb these kind of losses. War isn't a game where you get to reboot and start over. This is when it starts to come a little more into focus. But I love that it could just be Rackham's particular crazy teaching style. You'll be ready to face the real enemy and you'll be the finest commander we've ever trained. At this point, even Graf is starting to maybe feel something and possibly question what they're doing and almost protectively step between Ender and Rackham while Rackham has taken over the do-whatever-it-takes mindset. Ender, the enemy's gate is down. Battle school callback. And so apropos because it's still just a game. He's abandoning his entire fleet. He's in command. There's no stopping him now. Another cliche dodge. I can't say I would have hated hearing it's Ender's game now. But that's why I don't write screenplays. We destroy the planet. We destroy the queens. Game over. Of course, all his training, every confrontation has led to this. Win all future battles. Again, I'm just a sucker for awesome sci-fi visuals. So, yep. Another one of those movies with a completely different feel on second viewing. Or if you know what's really happening. Yay, they won. Oh, no. You won. What do you mean we won? He said it was a game. It was them or us, Endo. You've won all future battles. You destroyed them. Since I watched this before reading the book, this twist blew my mind. I felt just as manipulated as Ender. And I'd have to say that even after knowing the twist in the book, it's still such a crazy juxtaposition to their celebration of passing the exam. Stay away from me! You lied! I've killed an entire species! And as much as Ender is sick over what he did, he's disgusted with himself for why he did it. He fell prey to essentially the same trick he used against Stilson and Bonzo, appealing to their pride. Graf knew that as long as it was a game, Ender would do anything to win because he needed to prove himself. And Graf used that against him. We lost a thousand men on the transporters you abandoned. I abandoned them in order to win! So this is probably a point of contention, but you can't have completely automated everything. You need people to do some things sometimes, like maintenance or visual fail-safes when all else fails. The way we win matters. And that's true on multiple levels. What if there is another colony? What if there's something someone else watching? They just learned that humanity isn't interested in diplomacy. They can't be reasoned with. And actually, there's a line in the book before this final battle. Rackham says something like, the buggers never deliberately attacked civilians. Ender just wiped their entire species out. Ender's strategy would have been different had he known it was real. And one thing you may have noticed that Graf clearly missed is that before both Ender's big confrontations, he tried the diplomatic solution first. Come on, man. <laughs> Look, you can say you want. I'll say you taught me a lesson. No, coward. Raise your fists. The Formix accessed the game through me. Just in case there was any confusion on your part about whether the Formic Queen was actually communicating with Ender through the mind game, this is the castle that was blown up in the game. Pretty similar to the actual structure. I gotta give them credit for not shoving in a love plot with Petra. We all know these YA stories are wont to do that. So the Formics are gross, but beautifully, beautifully designed and detailed. 
I'll find a new home. I promise. And I give them credit for making me feel sympathy for disgusting bugs. My heart mostly breaks for Ender, but this chance at redemption to find them a new home leaves us with bittersweet hope. They've awarded me the rank of Admiral and left me to my own devices. If that's not the fullest, wishiest wish fulfillment ever. You're 11 and an Admiral. Here's all the money and a spaceship. Do what you gotta do. Uh, did I mention this score is amazing? Ender's Game is one of the first movies I decided to watch before reading the book, and I was glad I did. The book will obviously always be better, right? So why rob the movie of enjoyment? And if the book is bad, then eh. I enjoy film more than literature anyway. But the book is great, and the movie is great. The reveal in the book does hit a little harder because of everything leading up to it. It's worth a read. One thing I enjoy about the way this film is presented is the lack of trying to integrate it into our current world. The issues, themes, and wars are pretty much the same, but something about it is also very foreign. None of the kids are fishes out of water confused by anything. This is their reality now. A perfect yet simple example is how no one tells Ender to fasten his harness before takeoff. It's on him. These kids are responsible for their own lives. And they don't bother trying to shove too much future kid lingo down our throats, which is appreciated. I imagine a lot of people look at this movie as an indictment of war, specifically preemptive attacks, and just as many look at it as an endorsement. I think that's the beauty of this film. When you weigh all the facts, it doesn't really give you a concrete answer. Granted, whether or not wipe them out before they wipe us out is ethically sound isn't really the question. The question is, can you justifiably use a child to carry out the wiping without them even knowing? Again, I imagine plenty of people emphatically fall on both sides. I enjoy thinking about and debating the question more than defending one position. In the end, Carr does lean us in one direction. Ender, at least, believes a diplomatic solution should have been attempted and it's made pretty clear in the book. But that's a little too easy for me. I haven't read the other books, but at the end of the movie, it's just as easy for me to accept that the Formics were reaching out to Ender simply because he was the most intelligent, and because he was likely to be their undoing, and because they sense Valentine's compassion, and maybe it would have all been a manipulation leading to the end of humankind. So again, what's ethical, what's moral, what's right? Is one life, one soul worth the fate of your species? What about his life? Or if only one child has to be sacrificed, have we lost what we were fighting for? The way. We win matters. Is survival enough, or do we need to maintain what our survival is serving? And while those questions are posed, don't be mistaken, I'm not naive enough to miss the pure manipulation of the people in power. Every single thing they do is to push Ender towards that end. It was the reason he was chosen. Every time he proved he'd do what it took to not only win current battles, but all the subsequent battles, he only solidified his fate. I surprised you once. Why didn't you destroy me immediately after? The balance between Valentine's compassion and Peter's violence looked very different to Ender. And the trick of convincing these kids it's just a game. Whew. Games are, well, they're everything. Everything is a game. The movie opens with a game. Battle School is all about a game of laser tag. Command School is just a ramped up extension of that game. Ender plays more games when he's not training in games. Heck, Salamander Army is playing a game when Ender arrives. What's ironic about the usage of games is a thread that runs through the entire story is the one thing that all games have in common. Rules. You cheated. Their lives are structured around rules, and Ender has never played a game the way it was intended to be played. Something that gnaws at him, yet it's the very thing that made him the perfect weapon. Personally, I think the causation implied between what you're willing to do in a game and what you do in real life is a little stretched. But I understand the use of games as a tool to establish what you're capable of. So that's the big picture stuff, but ultimately we're presented this story through Ender's eyes. There's a line from Valentine where Ender's response isn't given. Or you might lose, but I don't think Ender's afraid to fail. In fact, he doesn't fail. I think he's afraid to win, because when he wins, it's final. Partly because he's almost this godlike being with no equal. No equal to the point that his first real challenge, he thought, was against an enemy he truly believed he understood. An enemy he thought was Mazer Rackham. In the end, the one thing I wish the movie had included from the book was how his use of the little doctor on the planet was not Ender's final solution to pass the test. He thought it would mean his failure. It was his way of basically saying, screw your game, push me and see what I'll do to win. He thought it would be the cheat that Mazer wouldn't allow. We actually do get a little glimpse of it with this line. How about that? Ultimately, that was what his entire story was leading towards. Unknowingly, he had proven himself to be the most ruthless mind in the galaxy. He ends up a war criminal who surpassed Hitler's wildest dreams. Honestly, there are quite a few similarities between Ender and Hitler. But my point is that we root for him. At no point did I question whether I wanted Ender to win. And I think a large part of the reason that resonates is the huge amount of nerd wish fulfillment. He's always the underdog, the bullied, the manipulated, the abused. So the rules don't apply to him? Or maybe we just root for him because he's the protagonist. I'm not even saying I would have done things differently in his position. I don't know. Either way, I'll always appreciate the things this story makes me think, feel, and question. 
I heard slash read complaints about Harrison Ford phoning it in. I even made a joke in my Force Awakens video like 18 years ago about how he seemed to come alive in that movie. But I wasn't talking about Ender's Game. I think Ford was totally present and invested in this film. His performance is just a little more nuanced than Space Cowboy this time around. He's playing a man who's had to turn off empathy towards children in service of saving his species, at least from his perspective. But he lets little ticks through that I think show a deeper character at times. I loved Asa Butterfield in this film. He had like maybe one or two off moments, but otherwise he kills it, especially his response to the final twist. I totally believe his surplus of emotions. Haley Steinfeld was the other standout for me, especially as a platonic relationship for Ender. Bold move to switch Anderson's gender for the movie, but God, it's Viola Davis. Annalise is hard enough for the whole cast. Ben Kingsley has a tendency to steal the show and he steals the show. The visual effects and CGI in this film are so seamless and beautiful, I often can't tell what's real and what's not. Which is even more impressive when you read that one of the effects studios went bankrupt partway through production. Just phenomenal stuff. Did they did they really put a station above Earth? I don't, I don't know, maybe. So anyway, this movie was written about the future from the 80s, and Ready Player One was written in the future about the 80s or something. I don't know. They seem related, and I wanted to do this movie. But I'm looking forward to Ready Player One. Looks fun. Next week, a movie that to pixelate or not to pixelate? Eh, pixelate. Sir. Do you have a name? My name's Trevor, Trevor Slattery. Don't hurt the face of an actor. Why? Hey, it's complicated, It right? is. It's complicated.